I'm Daniel Mullins. I run the University of Maryland Patients Program, which is a program that's designed to partner with the community to learn differently, to do research differently, and to share what we've learned so that people can make healthy decisions to improve the quality of their life. One of the great things about the Patients Program is as we become more involved with the community, the community is asking us to come and to share how we do things, to share information about how people can improve their health, um, but also just to come and get to know the community so that as we continue to do research differently, we do it in an authentic partnership with the community based upon their needs and their questions. One thing that's true about all people is we need to meet people where they are. The reason that we're out in the neighborhood today is that we want to meet patients and people where they live, where they work, where they worship. A lot of researchers don't know how to do that, and I laugh because it's as simple as walking out into neighborhoods and meeting people where they are. Um, the Patients Program helps to support researchers at the University of Maryland who haven't done that before. So we invite anybody to join the Patients Program to go with us to meet the community, and we also invite the community to join the Patients Program and meet researchers at the University of Maryland. One thing I've learned with the Patients Program at the University of Maryland is it is always better to ask your patients what they think, because that's what the patient's program does. You know, you have your opinion as a professional, and you would think that's the best way to go about it. But the best way, I believe, after working with the patient's program is to get the opinion of the uh, patient and try to incorporate this while you give your advice as a professional. In a community health event, it's much more social, it's much more relaxed, and the community is much more open to engagement. So they are open to uh, interact with you, share their opinions and stuff. And, but in the pharmacy, they feel like you're a professional. And they come in there for help, but they think you are, the only help you can give them is a, uh, your professional advice as a pharmacist. So you don't get to address all the other stuff they might have problems or need help with. So coming out in the community in a social event like this is something that helps you to get better understanding of your patients. I spoke with Dr. Mullins uh, a couple of weeks into uh, pharmacy school and from his explanation about his research and the patient's program, it was mainly uh, going to the communities and trying to interact with the community and bringing them into research and healthcare, you know, their healthcare. And that was something that intrigued me because that's something I want to do later in the future back home in Ghana, helping the community establishing a pharmacy back home. And that was something I saw that aligned with my future plans as a pharmacist. And I was really intrigued and I tried to uh, get on board with it. One thing you realize is uh, the community is not really aware about the health uh, issues out there. Another thing I would mention is uh, access to uh, health care. They probably don't uh, use the facilities available to them as they should, and that's something the patient's program highlights. It makes uh, the people in the community aware of uh, the facilities they have and the resources that are available to them. And we bring it to the community, we explain to them what resources the University of Maryland has to offer. Community outreach entails me keeping contact with other community organizations that pretty much have the same goals that we do. I've been doing community outreach for approximately 20 years in a volunteer organization called Mind, Heart and Body. Usually with other organizations they may have uh, an assortment of other issues that they're trying to hit or they may be focusing on one illness or disease in particular. Um, our program is focusing on five hypertension, diabetes, cancer, HIV, AIDS, and mental illness. As far as researchers are concerned, I think the best thing or the most novel approach that they can take is to be patient, to also listen to what the community is saying to them. As far as the community, they need to become more involved in, their, uh, in advocating for their health. They need to find out the answers to the questions that they have, and they just need to be more involved.
Ayana Holloway, I am a prevention specialist for the Beautiful Me program at Women Accepting Responsibility. A little bit about the Beautiful Me program, our program targeted population is transgender women ages 13 to 29, but we do not turn anybody away. In our program, we do outreach and HIV and STD testing during non-traditional hours so that we can reach our targeted population to get them tested to be more aware of their health and give them preventative services to keep themselves safe. Also, a part of our testing, we do counseling and we also offer an evidence-based intervention which, at our weekly support groups every Thursday. A big um, health issue in the transgender community is being connected to care and for HIV positive individuals and just getting them connected to care and making sure that they're adhering to their medication. The importance of being at an outreach event like this is so that we can give visibility to our programs and the services that we offer for people to come and get their lives in order, especially about the, when it comes to your health. We would like people to come to these events like this to receive the services we have to offer and also we can get them referral out if we do not cover the services that they may need at the time. The evidence-based intervention that we offer is Beautiful People. Um, it was created by CDC who did a number of studies in the African-American community for African-American women and how they could reduce stress, reduce problems in their life and issues created around keeping themselves safe and having better sexual behavior. Because we didn't have any evidence-based interventions here in the Baltimore area catered to transgender women, we adapted the evidence-based intervention sister, which was made for African-American women, and we adapted it to fit the needs of African-American transgender women here in the Baltimore area who face many things from homelessness to HIV. And our evidence-based intervention is made to help them make better choices in their life to keep themselves healthy and live longer, healthy lives. People have HIV and don't know that they have it until they get tested. A lot of people, once you mention anything about HIV, they kind of sort of get scared about it. But once I give the basic demographics of HIV and its prevalence in the community and give statistics about HIV and how it affects our community, people kind of sort of give in to the process of wanting to get tested once I convey to them that it is a confidential HIV testing and that all information conveyed to us will be confidential. All of our HIV testing we do here at Women Accepting Responsibility is confidential. All clients must sign a written consent form giving us permission to test them for HIV and any other STD or STI that they have. Uh, it's a very, very, very simple process, but we do the prick of the finger. We do the prick of the finger because it's blood um, and it's a 99.9% .9 accuracy. The prick of the finger to me is very, very, very effective because of course the blood don't lie and it tests the blood for the antibodies that causes HIV. So, you know, when you convey to the clients or the people that come on our mobile van, as you can see right here, and get tested, they usually, I usually give them or make them feel comfortable. And, you know, I test them. The result comes like a minute and a half. And as in my trainings of testing, you know, uh, CTR, we give the client the test result right then and there. If the client comes positive, we then do a um, com confirmatory, which we send to the Baltimore City Health Department, and the Baltimore City Health Department confirms that the client is positive. 
always, 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 whether a client tests positive or negative, I always talk prevention and condoms. When we get the preliminary positive, I do all of the prevention aspects and I, they kind of sort of, I kind of sort of get the client to walk me through their sexual activity of when we send it to the health department and the health department gives us the confirmation that the person is indefinitely positive, then they handle that part. But I still do follow-ups with the client and helping them get the best services possible, you know, once a person is revealed that they are HIV positive. Education, education is the key to anything. You know, and in the African American community, a lot of people do not educate themselves about its prevalence in our community. So it's my job as being a community leader, a advocate, to get the word out there to the people to help them get and maintain that comfortability of coming to get tested. It's important to listen because people come on our van to our organization broken and me giving a little bit of me to them. Sometimes in some cases, we are their family. We help them learn to love themselves. You know, it's very, very, very important to listen because like I said, it's different for many different people in many different cases, you know, but listening is the key to doing this type of work, being a service provider for any community. Hi, I'm Tony Polin. I'm an associate professor at the University of Maryland School of Medicine, and I run the Personalized Diabetes Medicine Program. Tony, a lot of people hear that there are two types of diabetes, type 1 and type 2, but you've told me there may be more than two types of diabetes. Tell me a little bit more. Sure. Well, first of all, yeah, the types of diabetes that, that most people are familiar with and most people do have are type 1 and type 2, um, but even that is um, a little bit misleading because actually type 2 um, has really kind of a lot of different things that could be going on. So in a sense, type 2 even is a lot of different diseases. Um, but, um, but there are also people who don't have type 1 or type 2. They have a variety of different specific types of diabetes. And a lot of those types of diabetes fall into the category, maybe 1 or 2 percent of all people with diabetes, the category called monogenic diabetes. So what does monogenic diabetes mean? What it means is that it's a very genetic form of diabetes and the genetics are different than other forms of diabetes. So genetics and um, family history play a role in, in just about all diabetes. And um, you know, if you have type 2 diabetes in your family or type 1, you're more likely to get it, especially type, one, type 2 runs in families. Um, but monogenic diabetes is different because instead of being caused by kind of a lot of a kind of a complex mixture of genetic factors and lifestyle factors. It's it's pretty much caused by a change in one single gene in, in any in a given individual. Because knowing that you have one of these specific forms of diabetes caused by a change in a specific gene can actually influence what kind of treatment you get for that di that diabetes and what treatment is most effective. So the real value and power of genetics largely lies in understanding what the what the genetic changes are, therefore what the changes in the body are and what's causing them, so that you can directly um, you can directly target those changes with how you treat the disease. Is is uh, is diabetes something that if my relatives have it, I'm more likely to have it? Absolutely. Anybody related to you by blood does mean that you're more likely to have diabetes. Um, however, depending on the type of diabetes, um, genetics may or may not tell, completely tell the whole story. Children can pretty much have any type of diabetes. Now most, generally, most children we think of as having type 1 diabetes. That's a type of diabetes where the immune system um, starts to destroy the body's um, cells that make insulin. Um, and that's called type 1 diabetes. We used to call it juvenile diabetes. We don't call it juvenile diabetes anymore in part because it turns out that it can affect people who are not children. Um, but also children can get type 2 diabetes, particularly if they are overweight and sedentary. 
But that's not even really the whole story because besides being able to get type 1 diabetes or type 2 diabetes, some children with diabetes um, don't actually have either of those types. They actually have a single gene form of diabetes. And so you may assume, and, and the, the danger sometimes or the, the concern is that you may assume that they have type 1 diabetes. And if a person has type 1 diabetes, then you start giving them insulin injections. If a child doesn't seem to be producing insulin, then giving the child insulin makes sense. However, you might be able to give the child even better treatment, treatment that's, that's safer, that's more effective, um, that directly targets the problem. If you knew, for example, that that child actually could make insulin, but needed a different drug, a safer oral drug, to actually help the child to, to release that insulin into the bloodstream. So if, if I want to ask my doctor to make sure that my child is receiving the right treatment for their specific type of diabetes, what questions should I ask my doctor? You could ask your doctor if, you know, if the doctor thinks your child has monogenic diabetes. You can also ask your doctor if your child has had, the t had testing for certain types of um, molecules called antibodies that distinguish between type 1 diabetes and type 2 diabetes and other types of diabetes. Um, whether the child has had a test called C-peptide, if the child is on insulin, then the, the C-peptide test can tell you if a child who is taking insulin is also producing insulin on his or her own. So those are the th kinds of things you could look at. There are also a couple of reputable websites that you can use to try to find the information. I outreach to everybody and anybody so that they can practice safer sex, get tested, and know their status. I typically reach out specifically to older adults because I find that they're the least educated, the most undereducated, and the last to be tested. Older adults go to the doctor with complaints and the doctor assumes it's due to aging, whereas a younger person can have the same complaints and the doctor will assume that they maybe need to be tested for HIV or some other STD. So older adults are being tested later and their numbers are escalating. It's transmitted sexually. There are older adults that do use drugs, okay? Primarily with older adults it is sexual. But it's the same as with younger people, except that most people don't want to think that older adults are sexually active. Most younger people don't want to think their grandparents are sexually active. Most doctors are younger than their older patients, so they don't stop to ask the same questions. Are you sexually active? Have you practiced safer sex? Do you need to be tested? Do you want to be tested? So it's a big problem in that the doctors don't outreach to older adults. Uh, about safer sex and sexual practices. When I finished speaking and I disclosed to them that at age 59 I was diagnosed HIV positive, I'm now 68 years old. And when I explained to them how I contracted the virus through unsafe sex, then they all understand that maybe they need to be tested. I don't ask anybody's business. I only suggest that they get tested. I have a tester with me and they don't hesitate to get tested. I wasn't angry, upset, or bent out of shape when I was diagnosed because I knew I had been exposed. I knew there was a risk that I did have HIV, um, unlike most people. I, the person I was with, we had known each other for 40 years. We went to high school together. We grew up on the same block. And so we began a relationship. We were both in our 50s. I was widowed. His wife had left him. I was depressed. At, because I was still grieving my husband, and he was in a bad place. So we were just two old friends leaning on each other. Consequently, we eventually had sex, unprotected sex, and he did not know, not know how to disclose to me his status. Fast forward a couple of years, and he gets sick with pneumonia, and I asked a very important question, are you HIV positive? And he was honest and explained to me, he just didn't know how to tell me for fear I too would leave him as his wife had. So I understood when I was tested that I was positive, but I would not die, that I could live a good life. And I immediately went into treatment. Get into treatment, stay safe, practice safer sex, and you will have a good life. HIV is not an end all. 
It's just uh, uh, an illness that has to be dealt with like diabetes and high blood pressure. My name is B.J. Shaneman. I am a clinical nurse, uh, an LPN. I have a master's and a baccalaureate in nursing science because the community is my love and this is my gift, my way of giving back to all those that I love. A lot of my friends would say that Dr. Saunders and I grew up together, although Dr. Saunders was 80 at his passing, which was a few months ago, and I am 70 now. Uh, Dr. Saunders was not only my mentor, he was like a dad. Uh, he trained me the way in which he wanted me to be. So when you saw him, you saw me. When you saw me, you saw him. I could not have ever asked for a better educator, a better friend, and a father figure as I had with Dr. Saunders. He's been a part of the Mind, Heart, and Body program, which was started over 27 years ago. Uh, he's always been my program advisor always available when I'm doing a health fair, I have a question, I can always call him in reference to a client. Um, Dr. Saunders is my heart. He's, he's my heart and he'll always will be. Dr. Saunders loved every community we touched, every community. That's why Mind, Heart and Body was such an important uh, adventure for us because we did not belong to any particular church or organizational uh, program funding and all of that. Our services are all free. All of the people that work in Mind, Heart, and Body volunteered their time, which gave us an opportunity to go anywhere we wanted to go. What do you say to a new researcher who walks in today and says, you know, how do I do research differently? know your community. I think that's something that I shared with you. Absolutely. Uh, that it is, when you're doing research, you are working with the people out here. Mm -hmm. It is more than just the project or the money. Right. You have to know the individual in order to really do a good research right. and to get the best candidate that you're looking for. Right. Um, you know, sometimes people say, well, where do you find patients? And I laugh because at some point in our lives, all of us either are patients or we have family members who are. Mm -hmm. So, you know, how do we get researchers to realize, you know, it's simple. It's, it is about being genuinely interested in people. That's it. That's it. And I know for years when I did research for Dr. Saunders, the type of event that we are having today, Mm -hmm. I'm doing blood pressure and diabetes screening and people with elevated blood pressures or diabetes, right. they were given an appointment to come into my office for their management of care. Right. And if that showed that they would do well in the research study, that service was offered to them. So not only did we get them for research, but now they have management of health care and they right. believe in you. Right. You right. know, and right. I have to say this with all my work that I am doing, any patient that I have assigned to come see me, if for some reason they miss an appointment, they will call right. me. And that's rare in a doctor's right. office. It sure is. They will call me and say, Miss BJ, I'm so sorry and apologize. But then right. they will want another appointment. Because they know you care. There's a, a way of educating a person, but getting on a one to one. Thing. Okay. I often, when I work with clients, uh, say if I'm working with somebody with cancer, I will say to them, uh, you know, you're never by yourself. I've had, I'm a two-time cancer survivor, and they right, go, what? Right, right. Or when I'm doing, uh, working with people with heart disease, and I'll go, yep, see my scar. Right. And, you know, and they go, because one of the things is that right. you are a nurse. Right. You are a health provider. How in the world right. did you end up right. having diabetes or high right. blood pressure right. or heart disease? Right. Now I've got them on the hook right. because now we have a partnership we both okay. share. I, I want to say that a lot of times we use the excuse, I will be all right. I know okay. I did. Okay. I kept saying, I'm fine. I'll be I, I'll get over it. But I kept pushing, I kept pushing, I kept pushing. Mm -hmm. And the interesting thing for me, and I'm still trying to figure this out, when I had to have my triple heart bypass and a flip, I never was sick. 
partying, having a good time and all that. Right. Never got sick. Monday morning, went sure. to the hospital for a simple right. MRI for my arthritis, and right. they gave me nitroglycerin, which right. blew open my blood vessels right. because they were so weak from my arthritis right. as well as cholesterol. And one of my surprises when my heart surgeon told me that my arthritis cre helped create my heart disease, I looked at him because as a nurse, I'm going, arthritis is right. a bone disease. Right. And then he looked at me and he said, think about it, BJ, what is arthritis? Right. I had to realize that it is an autoimmune disease. Right. So when I am teaching and I say to my clients, I stand before you as a person with an autoimmune disease, they go, Right. What? Right. You got right. AIDS? right. Right. No. Right. Cancer is an autoimmune right. disease. Arthritis. Right. Gout. Right. I'm born with. I was born with lupus. Right. All of those are autoimmune right. disease. But I always say, but look at me. Uh -huh. I am out here doing what I want right. to do. And physicians do not encourage right. their client right. to allow them to do what they want to do. And the other thing is, physicians call their clients patients. Right. You're not a patient unless right. you're sick in the hospital. Exactly. And exactly. you you know me for years and I taught you right. that. Right. Whenever you're working with community people, they are clients. Right. They are not patients. Patients right. mean sick to right. people. Because it is not fully explained to them that if you continue to smoke and continue to drink and your numbers continue to be extremely high, you could go have, you know, heart disease, you could have a stroke. Anything right. can possibly can happen. Learning to listen, you know, mm -hmm. is important. And I think we want to teach patients to ask good questions of their health care providers. Right. Uh, but we also want to teach health care providers and especially researchers how to listen, right? Mm -hmm. So the University of Maryland Patients Program, you know, one of our slogans is that we listen to the voices of patients and then we make sure that the patient voice is incorporated in how we plan our research, how we do our research, and how we deliver solutions mm -hmm. back to the community. Mm -hmm. How do we teach researchers and how do we teach clinicians how to listen to patients? <laughs> it is going to be extremely hard because they are working against a time frame. Mm -hmm. You have two minutes for a patient and that's it. One of the little things that Dr. Saunders and I did to solve that problem was that I triaged all of his patients. Okay. Because as his clinical research nurse, but as a triager, I had the time to listen, okay. to answer questions. You know what I mean? She can tell me things that she wouldn't tell the doctor. Right. Example, I will do her triage, and I'll walk in and give Dr. Uh, Saunders her information, and Dr. Saunders will say to the client, and how are you feeling today, Ms. Jones? Oh, I'm feeling fine, Dr. Saunders. Right, right. You see, you, you right. see what right. she went from all these things that are going on with her to tell this little nurse but when right. she get in front of the doctor now it's like the guard complex right, right, right. you know what i mean and that is what destroys relationships one of the things that i tell all my clients because i use the navigation of healthcare system services along in my new center first of all they're the right questions down Right. and then present them to the doctor. Okay. The other thing is if the doctor says something that they do not understand, okay. and if Dr. Saunders was standing here now, he'll tell you that that's true, they'll come back and ask me, Okay. what did he mean? Mm -hmm. What is this? And I'll explain it to them or I'll say, let me call your doctor. I actually show and tell my clients how the heart beats, okay. the importance of taking your medicine, what exercise do for you, what full sleep does for the brain. If they can see it, right. now they visualize it and understand it often. Okay. I know before I open my mouth, this, if I say the word research, people are going to say, oh, you're looking for guinea pigs. Right. So what I do is I use my services of screening with their health disparities in okay. order to put them into a frame of mind and show them where I can offer a service that's going to benefit them. Okay. That service just happened to be research. Okay. And then explain what it is the research is about. Mm -hmm. And give them an opportunity. I'm one of these people that I don't like to screen you and consent you to death. Right. I want you to go home and think about right. this thing, draw lines, and we will talk. Right. Because now 
I you have I have given you that opportunity to prepare yourself for this. Right. Well, this is part of the respect, right? The right. respect for humans you got to is have saying it. that if we're really talking about informed consent, mm -hmm. I should be able to think about my decision in more than 15 minutes. Yes. Right. And, yes. and I think that's part of the reason that patients sign up and then drop out of research right. is they didn't really want to be in it, but they didn't have time to think, think through it. You right. need to, whenever you are approaching a research client, those people need to be approached like they're gold. Right. Well, also, I look at you, and I think that you give people time, and yet I've seen you get 150 patients into a study <laughs> much faster than the traditional way. So I don't think that taking your time means taking more time to get patients, right? That's, that's right. faith. That's right. faith. My clients, once they do a research study with me, most of the time they're calling me, Miss BJ, what do you have available? Right. Right. That is faith. Well, this is the vision that I have, is that more patients would understand that research is how we find cures, how mm -hmm. we find medicines that make people feel better. Mm -hmm. um, and I think if more people took the time to partner mm -hmm. and to listen, mm -hmm. you know, and to be honestly mm -hmm. interested in patients, mm -hmm. uh, that more people would be able to do research the way you do research. Yes, DJ. that's true too. But I'm, I'm going to say this. A lot of times the client is not hearing, as you know, and I've right. taught you this. Sure. They're not hearing that we're doing this to, right. for the future of saving lives and, right. and all of that. Right. They, you, we're doing this because you have this problem, and what we're doing with you, you never know. It may help your child, right. your mother, your grandmother. Right. You know, and it may be something that is in, for example, your genetics. Continue to serve and do what you do best. Research is one of those things, and I'm an old researcher from 50 years worth, so it is important. But make sure you are aware of what it is that you are doing to yourself or allowing others to do.